Hi there, I'm Andrew Stevenson. I'm a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Southampton. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about Al-Farabi's political philosophy. So this is a topic that will touch on aspects of the AQA A-level philosophy syllabus, in particular, the topic of virtue ethics in the moral philosophy section. But it's also going to go well beyond anything in that syllabus, because that syllabus doesn't include much non-Western philosophy. And Al-Farabi was one of the great Islamic philosophers from the so-called Islamic Golden Age. Before we start, um, be sure to check out the other videos in this series where philosophers at Southampton are covering the whole AQA A-level philosophy syllabus and more, including more Al-Farabi. So, let's dive right in. What's Al-Farabi's political philosophy? In particular, what's his theory of the state? Well, to answer this question, we're going to need to start with some background. And in particular, we're going to need to look at Plato's psychology and at Plato's political philosophy, his theory of the state. Once we've done that, we'll be in a position to consider Al-Farabi's critique of Plato and his own political theory. So, Plato's psychology. What is his theory of the mind or soul? Well, Plato thinks that the mind or soul has three fundamental parts. He offers a tripartite theory of the soul. We have an appetitive part to the soul, which consists in our desires and inclinations. We have a spirited part, which consists in our emotions, such as courage and fear or whatever. And we have the rational part of our soul, where our reason and knowledge reside. According to Plato, the rational part of our soul is like a charioteer steering two horses. The horses need to go in the same direction, and the charioteer is responsible for this. But without the horses, the charioteer wouldn't be able to move at all. Um, and the charioteer wouldn't be able to do anything. With their reins and their whip, they would be useless. The point is, according to Plato, we are at our best when all three parts of the soul act in harmony. For example, when we fear something dangerous, so desire to avoid it, using our reason to work out how. On the other hand, then, we're weak when we're divided. For example, when we want something, but we don't have the courage or know-how to get it. Now, that's Plato's psychology in a nutshell, and his political philosophy in particular, his theory of the ideal state is based on his psychology, his tripart theory of the mind or soul. Thus, he offers us a tripart theory of the state and society, divided into workers who represent the appetitive part of the soul or society, the guardians who represent the spirited part of the soul or society, and the rulers, sometimes called philosopher kings, though in fact Plato tends not to discriminate on the basis of sex or gender. In any case, it's these philosophers and rulers who represent the rational part of the soul or society. And just as with the soul, the rational philosopher rulers um, must be the leaders. They must organise and guide the other parts of society. But equally, the other parts of society, the workers and the guardians, will be just as necessary for a well-functioning state. The guardians must enforce the will of the people. Uh, sorry, the guardians must enforce the will of the rulers as well as protect the state from outside inference, while the workers have to provide for all by producing food and homes and so forth. Now, this is a very hierarchical picture of the ideal society, one we might find quite abhorrent today. And I want to focus on one aspect of this, which is perhaps particularly relevant in today's political climate. And that is, as Plato sees things, only the philosopher rulers need to know the truth. That is, only they need to understand why society is organised the way it is. The workers and guardians just need to do as they are told, without understanding why, without understanding things Plato's theory. And to this end, the philosopher rulers are permitted, indeed they're required to use what we would call propaganda. In, may pl in more Platonic terms, terms, the workers and guardians need to be sold a myth or an allegory, Whatever keeps them in line, even if it's not strictly the truth. Bear that in mind. Now, like I said, this is a view that we might find abhorrent today, for many reasons. But in fact, Al-Farabi had no problem with this part of Plato's view. Al-Farabi's critique of Plato was different. He accepted the idea that there, were, that there should be an epistemic elite. And he accepted the idea that an epistemic elite was permitted, indeed required, to, in effect, lie to the masses. He just thought that Plato's account of this elite was incomplete. In particular, Al-Farabi thought that, 
If the rulers are charged with keeping the masses in line with noble myths, they will need not only reason and knowledge, but practical and rhetorical skill. Their propaganda had better be good. Moreover, since leaders are also meant to lead by example, they are supposed to act as noble ideals that the masses try to emulate, a little like celebrities. So the rulers will also need moral virtue. They need to be good people. Now, it's debatable whether Plato's account really does lack these features, but what I want to focus on it, um, for now is the way in which Islam comes into Al-Farabi's view at this point. Bear these, um, these aspects of Al-Farabi's critique of Plato in mind. For Al-Farabi, the prophet is the ideal ruler, above even the philosophers as the epistemic elite. For only the prophet has perfect God-given knowledge and understanding such that their theoretical and practical virtues, the different parts of their soul, are all maximised and in perfect harmony. Everyone else, philosopher rulers, workers and guardians, might have partial virtue, but not maximal virtue. And the different parts of their souls are not going to be working perfectly and are not going to be in perfect harmony. Let's drill down into all this a little bit more and see how it affects Al-Farabi's theory of the ideal state. To start with eudaimonia, Al-Farabi follows Aristotle's account of eudaimonia, which is to say his account of human, human happiness or flourishing. He thinks it consists in four virtues. Theoretical virtue, which is knowledge of what is true and what is good. Deliberative virtue, which is knowledge of how to attain what is good. Moral virtue, which is the desire for what is good and the practical arts, which consists in the ability to attain what is good. Now, Al-Farabi, more or less like Aristotle, thinks that all four virtues are going to be required for flourishing, right? for being a good human, and that is ultimately for being good. After all, to be good, you better know what's good, okay, that's theoretical virtue, but you're also going to need to know how to attain it, that's deliberative virtue. Otherwise, your theoretical virtue would be idle. You would know what's good, but you would have no idea how to bring it about. But alongside knowing what's good and how to attain it, you're going to want to attain it. You're going to want the good. That's moral virtue. And you're also going to need the ability to attain the good. So all these four aspects of all these four different kinds of virtue are required um, for realizing perfection, for being good, flourishing and happiness. And crucially, for, our, um, for Al-Farabi, only the prophet possesses all virtues perfectly. The rest of us don't. Instead, since we don't possess all virtues perfectly, we're going to have to cooperate under the guidance of the prophets. And it's this feature, the fact that we're all imperfect other than the prophet, and thus have to cooperate in order to realize human perfection, that leads to Al-Farabi's political philosophy, his theory of the ideal state. So, remember that only for prophets, according to Al-Farabi, attain perfect happiness, flourishing and virtue. That is, only they perfectly and maximally realize all four virtues in harmony. As rulers in Al-Farabi's ideal state, they must guide us towards this state of perfect happiness, flourishing and virtue, through their teachings or the ideal example they set. Yet we individually can never reach it. We can try to be like the prophet, but we will never fully succeed. For the rest of us, such a state of perfect happiness, perfect flourishing and perfect virtue, would only be so much as possible as an emergent property of a group of people working together. That is, if a group of people have complementary virtues that can jointly add up to perfection. And that's all to say that for Al-Farabi, human perfection, other than in prophets, is, as it were, a state of the state. It's a property of society. In particular, it's a property of society that will... Um, in particular, it's a property that a society will have if it works together under the guidance of the prophet so that each individual in that society is able to cooperate with one another to make the best of themselves. And in so doing make the best of society as a whole. So, we'll go into a little more detail in a moment. But note that this view faces a number of pressing questions. 
And here are two of them. Is Al-Farabi's theory of the ideal state democratic or anti-democratic? And does it leave any room for freedom? Might it even in a way encourage freedom? To understand Al-Farabi's theory, it's going to be useful to look at these questions in turn. Start with democracy then. The political theorist and philosopher Leo Strauss argued that Al-Farabi's theory is distinctly undemocratic, and that's certainly how it can look at first glance. In Al-Farabi's state, there's no majority rule. Remember, the prophets in charge, the epistemic elite, decide what to do. There's no majority rule or equality of vote. There's also no informed consent. Remember that the elite rulers, the prophet and the uh, philosophers, they can and indeed must use their rhetorical skill to persuade or manipulate the masses to conformity. And in fact, although we haven't really touched on this here, there's no respect for state sovereignty in Al-Farabi's view. According to Al-Farabi, foreign infidels must be conquered and shown the one true path. Okay, but put that aside for the moment. Now, as with Plato, if not more so, much of this can seem abhorrent to us nowadays, and perhaps it should do. But is it right that the theory is undemocratic? Well, that depends on how we understand democracy. And for Alpha Abbey, as for Plato, democracy meant equality of freedoms, not equality of votes. So let's turn from democracy to freedom and take a, look, a closer look at this issue. Recall that for Alpha Abbey, Human perfection, human perfection, other than in profits, is a state of the state. I.e. the state in which we all take our natural places to effectively exploit one another's natures to achieve perfection collectively. And this goes for the epistemically or rationally elite who run things, as well as for Alpha Abri's equivalent of the workers and the guardians. That is, the epistemically elite are only epistemically elite. Their rational natures are exploited as much as anyone's, and their noble lies only are permitted insofar as they help the rest of us to act collectively so that we can all act in accordance with our own natures. So the idea here is of a society where everyone's place in that society is fixed by their basic nature, the virtues they possess and what they're best at. And this society is to be organised so as to enable each of us to make the best of ourselves if you like, to be true to ourselves, to be true to our own natures, and to do so in such a way as to help everyone else do the same. And all with one overarching goal, that of achieving human perfection, collectively and under the guise of the prophet. That's al Farabi's picture. Now, suppose we ask what it is to be free. Well, arguably, to be free is not merely to be able to do anything whatsoever. If that were freedom, then none of us would be truly free. Arguably, to be free is to be able to do anything we really want to do. And, again arguably, what all of us really deep down want to do is to act in accordance with our basic natures, be they rational, spirited, or appetitive. Or some mixture, of course. And if freedom means being able to act in accordance with our natures, then perhaps al Farabi's theory of the state is supposed to be one in which, in a deep sense, we're all equally, indeed maximally, free. Remember what the picture is. The picture is one in which um, everyone's place in society is fixed by their basic natures, the virtues they possess and what they're best at, and society is to be organised in order to enable each of us to make the best of ourselves, to be true to ourselves, to realise our own natures to a maximal extent, in order to collectively achieve human perfection under the guise of the prophet. So if we take this account of freedom and this understanding of democracy as concerned not with equality of votes, but with equality of freedom, then we can start to understand why al Farabi, quite remarkably at the time, wanted to argue that his view of the ideal state was democratic. I'll leave it there for now. There are no doubt worries and um, objections one could raise to al Farabi's political philosophy, but for now at least, I'm going to leave it to you to come up with those. And maybe we'll do another video at a later time. Thanks for watching, and um, be sure to check out the information below this video for study questions and suggested reading, as well as um, the other videos in this series. And check out our website or follow us on Twitter, 
um, and Facebook for more from Philosophy at the University of Southampton. Thanks very much and bye for now.